Good afternoon, church. Hey, uh, so, as I said, as summer is ending now, um, I would just, I'm just curious, what, where are some places, maybe you took a vacation, took a trip, maybe you went to an exciting place, a different place? Throw me, throw me a couple names of places that you visited or places that were awesome this, this summer. Odessa. Odessa. <laughs> yeah, Odessa. Odessa. <laughs> All right, a couple more. Florida. 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 Georgia. Georgia. All right, represent. All right. San Diego. San Diego. Okay, that's, that's okay. All right. All right. Chicago. Chicago. That's awesome. Uh, well, for my family and I, uh, last week we took a trip with a couple of other families, including Michelle's family, uh, to Padre Island, close to Corpus Christi. All right. And uh, man, it was an adventurous trip for me. And there was one fun fact I discovered during that trip is that Michelle is uh, an avid fisher. She is a fishing enthusiast. She is serious about fishing. And uh, I did not know that, guys. I've known her for years. And I just <laughs> never knew. Uh, and the other family, too, Eddie uh, and Jenny, they're also, man, I was the only one that, you know, doesn't really fish. <laughs> but... Uh, But anyways, uh, so one of the highlights of our trip was actually going deep sea fishing on a charter boat. We went, we took about, uh, actually for me, it was a low light, and I'll tell you why. But the highlight for the rest of us uh, (laughs) was two hours on a boat there uh, into the sea, an hour of fishing, and then two hours back. And our goal was to catch as many red snappers uh, as possible. For me, it was purely economical, y'all, all right? I was just like, I want food, I want fish on this trip, all right? So at first, for like the first 30 minutes, I was doing all right. I was doing okay. Yeah, I wasn't, you know, things were, things were go- going good. I, you know, I was enjoying the beauty of the sea with the sun glimmering and all that jazz, but the first 30 minutes was all right. But soon after, I started to get dizzy, nauseous, and weak, and some of you guys know where I'm going with this. I was getting some major seasickness. And I took like four tablets of Dramamine or whatever that is, and it had no effect on me. I mean, I went above and beyond the dosage, and I was doomed, all right? And uh, just discovered the hard way that the Lee gene was not designed by God to be fishermen, all right? Me and my my son as well, (laughs) okay? Uh, And I was so sick, in fact, that all I could do during the whole trip was just basically watch other people fish, because I had no strength at all and everybody else is excited reeling in fish and I'm just sitting in there going ah, you know the whole time uh, and I won't go into the the details of that and one of the worst things was having the fishermen the boatmen actually like walk past me and I mean in my in the embarrassment of I'm like internally they're judging me like man what is this guy like he just he's been sitting there the entire five hours right um, but uh the worst part of all of it was the realization for me that we are out two hours away. There is no going back. I could not, in my mind, I'm like, make it stop, make it stop. There's no making it stop. There's no way out. I am hopeless and helpless, stuck out at sea for the remainder of the five hours. Today, we're going to look at another story as we continue our iconic story series of this group, a group of disciples who are also helpless, hopeless, and stuck out at sea. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to be working from verses 22 to 33. 14, 22 to 33. And as you're turning there, this is the big idea, the big question that I want us to address together today. How do you walk by faith when you find yourself stuck in the storms of life? How do you walk by faith when you find yourself stuck in the storms of your life? Matthew 14, 22 to 20 to 33. All right? If you're turned there, say amen. Amen. All right. Or flip there on your phone. Say amen. All that good. All right, verse 22 to 23, I'm going to first set the context here for us. It says in the story, immediately he, that's Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. 
So just for a little bit of context here for us, we're not going to turn to the passage, but this is, Jesus had just fed 5,000 men plus however many women and children were in the crowd with five loaves and two fish. He had just done a, a, a miracle, right? A miracle of miracles. And after feeding them, Matthew tells us that Jesus dismissed these crowds, sent the disciples away on a boat, and he decided to go out by himself to the mountain to pray. And it, this made me wonder, why would Jesus, after the hype of this glorious moment of, you know, feeding a miracle, of feeding so many people, this crowd, why would he choose in that moment to go and spend time alone? Was Jesus maybe like me, an introvert, who needed some me time to recharge? Or maybe, possibly, was it because Jesus was grieving the death of John the Baptist, who had just been executed earlier in the chapter, in chapter 14? Or is it possibly because what John tells us in his passage in John 6, that, that the crowd that he just fed were about to force him to become their king? And he was trying to prevent that from happening. What, we don't exactly know what it is that led Jesus to go alone. But the, either way, the response here by Jesus in the moment, here and throughout the Gospels, through times of great joy and deep sorrow, Jesus consistently prioritizes spending time alone with the Father. That's one thing that we see time and time again. No matter the situation, Jesus prioritized spending time alone with his Heavenly Father. And I think this is an important fact for us to remember. If even Jesus, who is God, prioritized spending time alone with his Father, how much do we need to prioritize spending time alone with our Heavenly Father? I know as things are picking up right now in the fall, it's getting busy, y'all. I, I get that. The tyranny of the urgent is definitely real. But in the midst of all of our busyness, are we getting lost, distracted, for the main priority, the, the, the need of our soul, to spend time alone with God. If we do not spend this time with him, that sense of emptiness that we seek, we, we seek to cope <laughs> with distraction, that's only going to get worse and worse and worse. So I just want to encourage us as a church, prioritize your time alone with God. Only God can fill this, this emptiness in your soul. Let's continue in the story. Verse 23, when evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Matthew tells us that in the darkness of the evening, the, this boat was about three to four miles away from the land. That's what John 6 tells us. And all of a sudden, as the disciples are on this boat in the middle of the sea, the winds begin to roar, the waves begin to rage, beating up. In the, in the Greek, it's actually harassing, abusing this boat. This boat is getting rocked, y'all. The disciples, in other words, found themselves stuck in the middle of a storm. And now let's continue to see what happens. Verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So it says in the, four, in the fourth watch of the night, that's around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Who in here likes to be awake at 3 a.m. to 6 a.m.? Right? <laughs> okay. You got one verse in. <laughs> All right. In the fourth watch, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., the darkness of the night, Jesus comes up on these disciples who are scared out of their wits in the storm by walking on water. And this is not one of those, like, I don't know if you've seen those viral TikTok videos or whatever, of, like this, these dudes pranking people, acting like they're walking on water, but it's actually like the elevated ground with a little shallow pool, or I don't know if Kanye did that on his on his uh, walking on water video. Okay, it's not one of those prank videos. This is, guys, this is the sea. This is the middle of the sea. Like, I was on that boat, right? Two hours in, and I'm like, everywhere I look, it's just miles and miles and miles of deep blue sea. And there's like fish like popping out over the waves. And in my mind, I'm going, 
Those things that eat that fish are under the waves. There's no chance I'm going to go walk on that water. Jesus decides to walk on water. And he comes up. And for us, we don't really get scared by that because we are reading in a, in a book, y'all. Jesus walked on water. But can you put yourself in those disciples' shoes for a second? It's dark. The winds are howling. The waves are raging. The boat is rocking. And then there's this shadowy figure in the middle of the sea that's walking closer to them. How many of you guys knew that there were horror film scenes in the Bible? And just as an aside, I don't know, some of you guys actually like watching horror films. I don't know why you like to torture yourself, okay, with, with that. But for me, I do not find it entertaining, all right? But uh, <laughs> when we find this scene, this horror scene in the Bible, Jesus just coming up. And they're just like, g -g 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 ghost, right? And I, you know, I was just thinking to myself, why, why would Jesus do that to him? Jesus, why are you going to troll him like that? He's like, hey, Holy Spirit, come over here. They think I'm a ghost. <laughs> let's, let's see. Like, you know what I mean? This is crazy. The text tells us the disciples were absolutely terrified when they saw the shadowy figure approaching them. And what, the reason why they thought it was a ghost because, was because in their culture, in their day and age, they saw, people saw the sea as an evil place, the domain, the home of the evil spirits. And so it made sense to them in their mind, in their worldview, we are on sea, the domain of evil. Look at these evil spirits coming at us. It says in the text that the disciples were afraid, were filled with fear. In fact, the word fear or phobos, where we get the word phobia, is repeated three times in this story. The author, Matthew here, is making this point to us. Look, there's a theme of fear. And why is he emphasizing fear? Is because if you want to live a life of faith, your worst enemy is fear. Fear is the greatest foe of faith. And this is made apparent in this story. Hey, let me ask you guys, if you're being honest with yourself, what are you afraid of? What keeps you awake at night? Anxious and afraid. Are you afraid of losing your job? Or your business imploding? Or not having enough money? or the uncertainties and the changes that you are experiencing right now in this season as school starts back up. Or maybe you're dealing with a health crisis and you're not sure what's going to happen. What are the things that you truly fear? And if we're being honest with ourselves, all of us have it. I certainly do. Uh, last week on a Saturday, this was the day after, or this was the day actually that we came back from our trip. At like 4 a.m. in the morning, I just had a, this passing thought that came in, up in my head about what happens. The question was, what happens when, Icon, when outside churches stop supporting Icon financially? How are we going to survive? And this thought that came in my head sent me in a vicious cycle of, of anxiety and worry. How are we going to support our staff? How are we going to continue to do our ministry? Is Icon going to survive in two years? These things just keep going out of control over and over. And you imagine all the worst case scenarios in your life happening all at the same time. Can any of you relate to these fears? And when we find ourselves stuck in this cycle, spiraling in fear, what do we do? How do we get out? Let's continue in the story. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. So in this moment of, this thriller moment of suspense, Jesus relieves the tension saying to the disciples, it is I, it is me, do not be afraid. Hey guys, it's just me. Can you imagine how the disciples must be feeling? And again, I'm like, Jesus, why would you do that to them? But... I'm glad he did say something, <laughs> right? You got to have a sense of humor when you're reading the Bible sometimes, guys, all right? The story continues. Then let's see what happens next. Verse 28, and Peter answered them, Lord, or answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, and Jesus said, come. 
So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. The first idea that pops up in my head if I'm seeing Jesus walk on water is, Jesus, get me out of this boat, teleport me to land, or stop the storm. It's not, hey, Jesus, that looks cool. Can I join you? Peter was an odd one, y'all. <laughs> he was a little daredevil that likes to do before he thinks. I mean, I think if he was in a horror movie, he would be, probably be the first one to die. That's, that's, I, think, I think that's Peter. I think that's pretty fair. I think Peter would tell me that's fair. All right? But we got to give Peter some credit here. When Jesus tells Peter to come, Peter actually, not just intellectually, actually, practically believes that Jesus, his words are true. And he takes a step of faith off the boat of safety and security and onto the waters of uncertainty. Peter obeyed even when it didn't make sense. And how many of us would be willing to do the same thing? To leave our boat of comfort, our security, of things that we know and feel safe with, to go and take that step onto the water of uncertainty. It's scary. But faith is not just meant to be understood up here, it's meant to be experienced in here. And when Jesus calls us to obey, it's actually obedience is an invitation to experience him. Your life is not meant to be safe. It's meant to be lived day by day with Jesus. Peter takes that step and models for us what faith looks like. Let's continue. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. So Peter started out strong, right? He took a step of faith onto the water to go to Jesus, but his faith began to waver when, his, when he started to look at his situation and his circumstances more than Jesus. He started to look at those ways. Again, Jesus had not stopped the storm yet. The storm was still raging. The wind was still, you know, roaring, right? Everything was still happening. And so as he is walking, and perhaps he stopped looking at Jesus and started looking down, and he saw those sharks. I'm, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just imagining. When he saw those, those things and what he's on and how crazy this is, and then he realized that there's no safety net. There's no guardrail. There's no guarantee. There's nothing. He's got nothing else to hold on to for dear life. He only has Jesus. He started to doubt. That fear started to rise higher and higher, and he began to sink deeper and deeper. Peter was afraid. And I don't blame Peter for that. I mean, how many of us have taken a step of faith because Jesus has called us to something, and we start out strong just like Peter did? But as we face opposition, as we start to face struggles, as we start to face trouble, we start to see our fears rise higher and higher and our faith sinks deeper and deeper. See, what I realized in church planting for me is that taking a radical step of obedience of faith like Peter reveals your deepest insecurities. It reveals when you got nothing else to hold on to, when you got no security, no guardrail, and you only have Jesus because you put yourself out there, Jesus begins to ask you if everything, if the only thing you have is Jesus, is Jesus enough for you? Or, or is what you need Jesus plus? Security, Jesus plus that cushy job. Jesus plus that spouse. Jesus plus that promotion. Do you need Jesus plus or is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough for us? And here's the thing. Jesus allowed Peter 
to step into the situation. Not out of spite, but because he wanted Peter to learn and to grow from this experience of faith. And he is asking Peter this question of, am I enough? And he's also asking us today, am I enough for you, brothers and sisters? And so Peter, as his fears start to rise up, he begins to cry out, Lord, save me. And let's see what happens next in this story. Verse 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt So when Peter cries out to Jesus, Jesus reached out and saves Peter from drowning. And after he saves Peter from drowning, he asks Peter this important question. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, I don't know about you. I don't know what the thought that comes up in your head when you are reflecting on this question. But for me... I started to ask myself, oh, you of little faith. So do you need to have like this certain amount of quantity of faith to be a person of faith? Or do you, like, is there some sort of threshold here that, what does he mean by like, oh, you of little faith? What does it look like to be of great faith? But if you're thinking the quantity of faith, like I did, you're th- I think you're thinking about it wrong. Because <laughs> I think the focus here and what Jesus is really trying to say is not about the quantity of your faith. It's actually the focus of your faith. He said, why did you doubt? In the Greek, the word doubt means that you are distracted, divided. Your attention is divided into multiple directions. He's saying, Peter, why did you start taking your eyes off of me and start looking at everywhere else where your attention was divided? And so your faith was weakened. It's about the quality of your faith. Your faith is ultimately dependent on your focus. What are you focusing on? Jesus says, focus on me. This then brings us to the main idea and our answer for this question. What do we do when we find ourselves stuck in the storms of life? How do we live a life of faith? It's by focusing on Jesus more than our problems. It's by focusing on Jesus more than our problems. We need to put our mind's eye on Jesus more than our problems, our Savior more than the storm. You see, in my case, last Saturday, whenever I started to get these, this panic attack and I couldn't sleep for, it was about an hour, I finally was able to sleep when I stopped thinking about the worst case scenarios and thinking about, okay, so these are all the questions that I have unanswered for the future and, and what I'm going to do and how am I going to figure this out? And what I had to realize was that, look, what I needed, what I knew, I might not know the answers to all the problems of the future, but I know who holds the future. And I know that he's trustworthy because he's never let us down. Through all the years of my life and through, for my family and through ministry, God has never let us down once and he's not going to let me down now. As we sang in that song, Firm Foundation, Jesus is our firm foundation and because of that, he's worthy of our focus. And if you're feeling like I did this great sense of anxiety. Look, feeling anxious, I think, to, to some degree, is human. All of us have. Because anxiety is feeling like your life is getting outside of your control. But I think in our anxiety, we tend to think that anxiety, that when we're anxious, we're in a helpless situation. But what if you think of it not as a helpless situation, but as a gracious invitation? And you think of anxiety as an invitation to depend more on God and to draw nearer to God and to be even more intimate and close with him. And cast all your anxieties upon the Lord, for he cares for you, Peter says. Now, some of you in this room may be wondering, hey, so I get this. You said focus on Jesus, not your problems. Got it. That sounds a little bit too simple. 
And maybe the question you're as, asking in your head is, why should I focus on Jesus? Why is Jesus worthy of my focus more than my problems? Because I, I don't know about that. So there's two reasons I believe in the text the author tells us for why Jesus is worthy of our focus more than our problems. And the first reason is because Jesus is God. Plain and simple. It says, you know, in the earlier when the disciples were gripped in fear and, and Jesus calls out to them, commanding them, hey, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. And he says, it is I. In the English, it says, it is I. In the Greek, though, in the original text, it's actually I am. Jesus is actually echoing what Yahweh God said about himself in Exodus 3.14 I am that I am. This is the name of God. And Jesus is saying, I am the, the same I am that delivered his, the Yahweh who delivered his people from Egypt and who was sovereign over the waters of the Red Sea and who, part, who showed it by parting the Red Sea. Jesus is saying, I am the same I am who now is sovereign over the waters and is standing on top of the waters, this seed, this domain of darkness and evil that you're so afraid of, I am that I am. And this one little statement, I am, changes everything. Is because if Jesus is God, if the Jesus of the New Testament is the great I am, then Jesus is able. That there's no storm in our life that is beyond his ability. There's no forces of evil that's beyond his victory. There's no greater evil out there. Jesus is all powerful and all sovereign. The great I am. And we see this, we see Jesus put a little exclamation mark on this statement. When we see that when Jesus enters into that boat, what happens? In verse 32, the storm stops. It ceases. Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is God. And this is why the disciples in verse 33 respond in worship, saying, truly, this must be God. This must be the Son of God. And this also, this Jesus saying, I am, echoes for us what God told Joshua in Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged because I, the Lord, am with you wherever you go. And Jesus says the same thing to his disciples and to us today. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For I am with you wherever you go. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing on earth, nothing in heaven, no situation. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid because he is with us. This is why he's worthy of our focus because Jesus is God. Second, it's because Jesus is good. Because he is good. How do we see the goodness of Jesus here in this text? His, I think it's through his compassionate care for his people. Again, we are just reminded of this amazing story of how Jesus had compassion for 5,000 men and the countless thousands and thousands of women and, and children. He fed them with five loaves and two fish, and he, cared, he was burdened for their hunger. And then we hear in this text, what we see is that every single time that it says the disciples were afraid, it says that Jesus immediately responded. It says as soon as the disciples cried out in fear, Jesus immediately spoke to them saying, it's me, do not be afraid. And as as soon as Peter cried out, Lord, save me, Jesus immediately reached out his hand to save Peter. Jesus is compassionate. He is good. You see, when we talk about the subject of faith and when we look at the story, notice the focus of faith here is not so much on how much faith you have. But it's, the focus here is about how compassionate and kind and merciful Jesus is. It's not about you. It's not about your ability or your own works and righteousness. It's about the grace and care of Jesus for his people. And ultimately, no matter what we go through in the storms of our lives, we can trust that Jesus is good as we remember 
his ultimate example of goodness on the cross. When he gave up his very life, Jesus, the God-man, the one who was able, chose to give up his life for you and for me. It says in the epistles that God demonstrated, proved his love for us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And this reminds me, because Jesus loves me, and because he cares, that when I'm struggling, when I'm doubting, when I'm afraid, when I'm anxious, I am never alone. That when I cry out like the disciples and like Peter, Lord, save me, Jesus is never far. He is right there with me. In the darkness of my situation. Jesus cares. Jesus is God and he is good. These are the two reasons why he's worthy of our focus. And both statements are true. And why is this important? I think some of you guys, if you've been out there and, and share, try to share faith with people who are far from the Lord, maybe they've, there's a lot of the critics of the Christian faith would point out that these statements could not both be true. If, if there's a good God out there, then why would he allow suffering? It's either that God must be able, but he just doesn't care, or that God must be good, but he's ultimately weak. But here in this text, and in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel tells us that God is not limited to either one of these categories. The death of Jesus shows us that God is our good Savior who compassionately cares for us, And the resurrection of Jesus shows that God is all-powerful, able to overcome the problem of evil and suffering once and for all. The gospel shows us that Jesus is God and that Jesus is good and that no matter what suffering may come in our lives, we can trust him. And so the question then is, will you choose to focus on this Jesus or on your problem? If you're being honest with yourself, where is your mind's eye right now? As we close, I actually want to close with a story, an illustration of this reality. And so uh, if you guys can help me welcome up to the stage Tiffany to share her story. Um, Dave asked me to share um, this this passage is um, very dear to my heart because um, my missionary grandfather um, preached his last sermon, well, the last sermon that I heard um, on this passage, and um, I was there to witness it, and he shared the story of how when they first arrived in Brazil um, in the early 1960s, um, all of, the, all of the troubles that they experienced. Um, a short time after they arrived, um, my mom, who was only one at the time, um, fell and um, she lost a lot of blood. And so they didn't know the language yet, so they didn't know Portuguese. Um, they did not know many people in the city. Um, and she, she passed out, actually, from the blood loss. And so they ran to the neighbor's house to ask for help, but they didn't know where the hospital was. Um, so that was, um, that was very, very um, scary for them, um, especially for my grandfather. And um, they took her to the hospital, and he was able to donate blood um, so that she could have a blood transfusion. That's, that's what she ended up needing. Um, so me, my mother obviously did not die, because I am here. <laughs> um, and, but um, he, he shared that that was, that was very hard. And through that situation, the Lord um, used this passage um, and spoke to his heart. Um, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Um, A short time after that, um, he um, came down with, um, or he got hepatitis. um, Doesn't, didn't know how, um, but but also came very close to death. um, And the Lord spared him and um, again, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. um, The Lord um, put that on his heart. Um, And then not long after that, um, the Brazilian government um, was um, 
set to um, do a communist takeover. Um, and they found out years later that my um, grandparents um, and my, my mom's names were on a list to be killed uh, by the government because they didn't want any missionaries in the country at that time. Um, and thankfully that did not happen. They did not become a communist country. Uh, the military uh, took over, but um, that was also a very scary time for them. And um, the Lord used this passage um, to encourage them that they were indeed doing the right thing, that they were where they were supposed to be, um, even though it was very discouraging to have all of that happen in a very short amount of time. Um, and they were there to serve the Lord. They were, as missionaries, they were church planters. Um, and um, it, was, it was very scary for them. They were afraid. Um, he was afraid. Um, and um, the Lord uh, put that on his heart. Um, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Um, and I am here to tell the story. Um, praise God. <clears throat> I, I would have to say that um, I've never preached a sermon with a baby, holding a baby in one hand. <laughs> And uh, man, I'm so grateful to me for this story. And again, it just tells us the word of God is not just meant to be known up here. It's meant to be lived and experienced in our day to day. When you feel, when you find yourself stuck in a storm of suffering and struggle, and you find your anxiety creeping up, your fears creeping up, rising higher and higher, and you find yourself sinking deeper and deeper, how do you live a life of faith? by focusing on Jesus rather than the problems of your life, by focusing on your Savior rather than the storm. And again, if we're being honest with ourselves, I think everyone here in this room has storms that you're going through. Or maybe you're, you're not, you're okay right now, but it's coming. <laughs> That's the most laughter we got during this episode. <laughs> It's a hard realization, right? Either you're in it, you're coming out of it, or you're about to go into it, but storms are a reality of life. And so, I want to ask you to consider today, where are you focusing your heart? Where are you focusing your mind? Is there anything that's hindering your focus in the Lord? All you need to do is cry. mercy and grace is right there. He will never let you fall. It's available for you. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you that you are not only able, you are also good. I pray that, God, if there's anyone here in this room that is going through a storm, the Holy Spirit, that you would move their heart to cry out to you. That whatever is causing to, them to worry and be anxious, Lord, that they would be able to drop all their cares at your feet and experience the love of the Heavenly Father right there for them. I pray that there would be a freedom, a sense of a freedom that's felt today as we walk away from as we go out there into the community because we're experiencing the weight of the world being lifted off our, our shoulders. God, would you continue to work in us and through us? I pray all this in Jesus' name.